Well, you know how the old saying goes, war is hell. But what if there's something worse? What if you encounter something during war that makes you think that it isn't the worst possible thing that you can imagine? And so, we have a period piece this evening, coming from World War I and the trenches in France. Very interesting story indeed, and another from Dr. Creepin's Vault. The subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me so I could read them all for you. Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. October 5th, 1918. These are the last words of Corporal David S. O'Brien, Company D of the 306th Machine Gun Battalion. We are not allowed to write journals, as they could provide the Huns with valuable information. So, I'm writing this in my Bible, in the blank spaces available. I hope Jesus forgives me, for I am sure that I will be meeting him soon for my final judgment. At least, I pray that my soul will meet him. For the beast that stalks outside the pillbox my fellow squadmates and I had taken refuge in fills me with a faith-wavering terror. That yellow-eyed demon makes me question why God would allow such a creature to inhabit the world of men. How we got here is complicated and simple all at once. I don't have space to go into detail, but the short version is our division, the 77th, advanced into the Argonne Forest here in France. We believed that, as we battled forward, our left and right sides were being covered by our allies. We were wrong, and soon the Huns had us surrounded at Hill 198. My squad and I were assigned a far right position to set up our machine guns, but soon gunfire and smoke disoriented us, and we started fleeing back to where we thought the rest of our battalion was. We did not end up there, and spent a day lost in the forest, running from Huns whenever we encountered them, and trying to find a safe place to rest. As night was falling, we came across a seemingly standalone pillbox. As bullets did not come raining down on us the moment we came into view, we assumed that it was either an allied structure or an abandoned one. Again, we were wrong. This place used to be a pillbox under the control of the Huns, and it looks like they were starting another trench here, but they never got far. Bodies littered the ground and the inside of the pillbox, all torn to shreds. It looked like whatever got them was some kind of wolf or dog, but one of our boys, James Sullivan, said his family raised dogs and these wounds were not from any canine he'd heard of. He said they looked too cruel to be that of a dog. These men were being carved up alive and most probably bled out instead of dying of their wounds. We then wondered if this was the work of man. But there were no bullet wounds and we couldn't think of anyone with the strength or savagery to claw and rip open another human. Not even the Huns were capable of such viciousness. With the sun about to set, we cast these questions to the back of our minds and cleared up the bodies to make room for the nine of us. As head of our squad, I ordered everyone inside the pillbox and had the door and all the windows, which luckily had steel hatches, closed. I didn't bother to set up our gun, as we had no light source and I didn't want to bring enemy or friendly fire upon us by firing blindly into the night. I also elected to take first watch, as my men needed rest badly. Our doom was sealed that fateful night two days ago. Near the end of my watch, just before I was going to waken the next man, I heard a scraping at the door. It sounded like a man dragging his trench knife softly against the steel of the door. Drawing my pistol, I quietly made my way to the door, but just as I neared it, I heard the scraping sound from a hatch window on the other side of the pillbox. This made my blood run cold, as I assumed that it was an enemy company 
trying to get us to open the door or hatches so they could fire in at us. Silently, I woke the men one by one and communicated our situation. By the time each man was up with a rifle in his hand, the scraping had stopped at the door and original hatch and had moved to two hatches side by side opposite the door. We lit a lantern we'd found inside the pillbox so we could see better. Myself and Sullivan positioned ourselves to open the hatches while the rest of the men formed tight groups, each with a gun trained on the targeted hatch. On my mark, the hatches were opened, and we opened fire upon whatever was out there. The unearthly shriek that emanated from darkness, well, I have no words to describe. Even remembering it sends a soul-chilling shudder down my spine. When we first experienced it, everyone froze, unable to even move a finger to keep firing at whatever made that abysmal howl from the black of night. What was worse was that the scream wasn't one of pain and surprise, but one of anger and offense. We had incurred the wrath of something that wasn't of the world of man. Instinct snapped Sullivan and me out of our terrorized stupor, and we went to slam the hatches shut almost simultaneously. I was a little bit faster, and that saved my life, for the hatch had just closed when I felt something slam into it, trying to force its way inside. Sullivan wasn't so lucky, as his hatch didn't close all the way due to something blocking it. From the light of the lantern, we saw that it was a hand, or it could have been a paw, as I have never seen such a slender hand with long spidery fingers and claws as thick as knives adorning each finger. It flailed a moment, trying to find what was pushing the hatch onto it and keeping the rest of the arm from entering. Then it found one of Sullivan's arms. The claws sliced through fabric, flesh, muscle and bone like they were air. In an instance, Sullivan was on the ground, screaming and holding the bloody elbow stump that used to house his forearm. As the first of us snapped out of our haze of fear and started to rush to Sullivan's aid, the second terrible hand opened the hatch fully, while the first roughly grabbed Sullivan by the collar, and in a second... He was pulled from the pillbox into the night, his screams receding into the distance as whatever it was that grabbed him, dragged him to his certain death. No one slept for the remainder of the night. We didn't even have the courage to throw the bloody forearm that was the only remaining thing of Sullivan out of the pillbox. No, I would like to quickly record that James Sullivan was a good Catholic, a good man, and a good soldier. He didn't deserve to die that unholy death. But, unfortunately, I believe we shall all suffer the same fate. Private William Buckley was the next to die. When the sun rose, I ordered three men, including Buckley, to scout about 100 yards around the pillbox to see if we could find a path back to the rest of our division. We all knew that even if we didn't make a path back to Hill 198, we weren't going to spend another night in this God-forsaken place. As the rest of us watched from the open hatches in the pillbox, we saw the three men go into the trees. For a while, everything was quiet, except for the distant boom of artillery. A few of us noticed with disturbing revelation that there weren't any birds or sounds of nature in the woods. Something we hadn't ever experienced, except for one place. No man's land. A land of barren earth and death. Suddenly, screams erupted from the dense foliage. After a minute, two of our scouts came running into view. They made it back into the pillbox and howled for us to shut the hatches and door. We did so in haste, and when we questioned how Buckley was going to get in, they simply stated, 
he isn't going to be walking in, that's for sure. When I began to ask them to clarify their statement, the same angry yell we had heard the previous night erupted from outside. Two loud thumps came from two of the hatches, and then all went silent. It took us an hour to gather our courage to open the hatches. As we opened them, we could distinctly smell the strong scent of fresh blood. Lying on the ground, at the bottom of the two hatches, were two legs, and the fate of Buckley was verified. This angered me greatly, and except for the two men who were scouts with Buckley, we all agreed that we would try to kill whatever this thing was. We pressed the two men, Lawson and Jacobs, to tell us what the thing looked like, but they just sat quaking in their boots, unresponsive to us. The remaining five of us decided the best course of action was to lure the beast in front of the pillbox and then unload our machine gun into it. We set up the gun at the window, with the clearest view outside at the least dense part of the forest. Then I volunteered to be the bait. Well, I didn't want to do it, but as the highest-ranking soldier of the group, I felt it was my duty. Nobody argued against it, or volunteered to take my place either, so I knew that if this plan was going to work, it needed to be me to be in the most danger. Going outside and getting into position in front of the pillbox made me weak at the knees, but I stood my ground with my rifle in hand and scanned the forest for a sign of the monster. For a long time, nothing happened. The air was quiet, and there were still no sounds of nature as before, so I never let my guard down. By the time it was about noon, I was hot and tired from standing around with my nerves on edge and lack of sleep. As I began to sit down to rest, my eyes caught something in the trees that made me freeze in place. From behind a tree, about fifty yards away, I noticed part of a face peering out at me. I could not make out any discernible details, except that it was too pale to be human, and the eye that was fixed on me was a bright, infernal yellow. You must have noticed me noticing it, for after only a moment of us staring at each other, it shrieked and charged towards me. It was fast, and it was smart. It moved from tree to tree, giving me no clear shot at it. The only thing I could do was run back to the pillbox as fast as possible, yelling to my men to fire at the thing. Luck favoured me as I tripped and fell to the ground as the machine gun exploded to life, firing out its deadly barrage of hot lead into the forest behind me. The screams from the creature increased in volume behind me, and I thought, for a moment, my men had succeeded at shooting the damn beast. That was quickly shattered when a clawed hand came down inches from my face in the dirt. I thought I was going to be next to die in our squad, but that was not to be the case. The abomination ran over me and continued running towards the pillbox. I got a decent look at it then. It was totally pale and would have been taller than any man I'd ever seen, except that it was hunched, making it about average height. It wasn't naked as a dirty pair of very old-looking, torn pants, in a style I'd never seen, adorned its waist. Its legs looked almost human, except that its feet were also huge, and clawed just as much as its hands. I swear, I saw multiple bullets tear into the beast, yet it displayed no reaction to being shot with rounds that would tear a man apart. In a few seconds, it reached the pillbox and leaped through the open hatch into the room full of my men. There were screams and yelling, a few gunshots, and I witnessed the monster leap back out of the open hatch, two heads with the spine still dangling from their neck in each hand. 
I could only watch helplessly as the creature darted into the forest, but not before looking back at me one more time and winking at me. The idea of our inescapable doom first entered my soul then and there. Since that incident, where we found that the war machines of man would not save us, it has been slowly whittling my squad down. We try to make a massive break for it later in the day, with all of us scattering to try and make it somewhere, anywhere but here. That only caused it amusement, and by the time three of us made it back to the pillbox and slammed the door after us, two more of our squad became its victims. When we scattered, it had enough speed to appear before each of us before we got too far and herded us back to the pillbox. Coincidentally, its latest two victims were the two scouts who had seen it before. As a result, for our bravado retreat, we then had to listen to their pain-filled cries and moans as the creature killed them slowly, close by to our enclosure. When the second man's dying gurgles had silenced, I had had enough. I yelled as loud as I could in anger and confusion out of the hatch. Pourquoi? I've picked up a few French words in my time over here, and I knew that that was French for why. I don't know why I yelled in French. I guess I just thought that since we were in France, we might get a response, and maybe, with the grace of God, could talk to this creature and leave here alive. There was a long silence, followed by a shuffling and a dragging sound as what we guessed was the creature dragging one of the fresh corpses up to the pillbox. There was a sickening crack, and the sounds of flesh tearing, followed by welt splats against the wall outside. This went on for several minutes, with interval sounds of more cracking and tearing interlaced with the splat. Finally, the noises ended and were concluded with a laughter so diabolical sounding I thought that Satan himself was outside our pillbox. It took us a long time to open the door and look at the outside of our safe haven. On the flat surface facing where the creature had charged initially at us earlier that day were the torn body parts of one of the unfortunate men. In his blood on the wall was written, Ma maison n'est pas ton champ de bataille. I have no idea what this means, but I had a sinking feeling it was not a message of hope. A day has passed since then. That night, my two remaining men tried to come up with another plan to escape. By morning, they thought they had a good one and offered me a chance to come with them. I refused, as I knew then we were going to die here. When morning light filtered through the small cracks of the concrete structure, they left. I locked the door behind them and have spent the rest of my time writing this account. I did not hear any agonized screams during the day, so, I hope against hope, they made it back to Hill 198. To die there, by shells or bullets or gas, seems like a divine gift to me now. My time grows short. It is night outside, and I'm writing this by the dying lantern light. Earlier, I heard the sounds of knives against the door, like the ringing of my funeral bells. I won't let it in, however. I'd rather die from dehydration and starvation than give the demon the satisfaction of listening to my dreadful cries as it kills me languidly, even with my resolve. I know it's still getting perverse pleasure from watching me suffer in here. In the little light left, I can see blazing yellow and twinkling white in the small hatch slit at one of the windows. And I know they aren't the moon and the stars. God save me. My 
And another fantastic one there from Dr. Creepin's Vault. I hope you're enjoying these stories. I've been doing everything exclusively from the vault in the last few weeks because, well, there are just so many fantastic stories there. More than a thousand people on the subreddit now and a lot of them sharing stories. So everything is good. <laughs> well, I'll be back again on Wednesday with another story for you. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs> <laughs>